All right, hey everyone, welcome. Uh, first, I want to just thank you so much for sticking around to the last slot of the conference. I hope you've had a good time. Really appreciate this, and I very much value your time. I'm going to hope to have some fun with this and leave you with some tangible takeaways after this. So thank you for being here. If you're watching the recording, I hope it was worth it to you to make your train or wherever you had to be. But uh, thanks for watching and listening anyway to the recording. For those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Ryan Sleeper. I blog religiously at the site ryansleeper.com. Every Tuesday morning, I'll release some new tip, tutorial, strategy. Uh, it comes, uh, comes out at 3 p.m. British Standard Time every Tuesday if you want to check it out. I'm also on uh, Twitter at RyanViz if you want to connect there. And there is a hashtag for this event. It's TC18Europe. Please do. I encourage you to share if you see something that you like. I'm the founder and principal consultant at a company called Playfair Data. If you want to check that out, it's also on Twitter. Half my business is consulting and half my business is uh, training. Some quick uh, Tableau street cred. I'm a current and two-time Tableau Zen master. I'm the author of the Tableau Public Visualization of the Year in 2015. I was selected among 80,000 different Tableau Public Visualizations. And in 1964, I won the third iteration of the IronViz Championship. It's a little known fact, but the Who actually played at Data Night Out that year at TC. I also recently finally had a book come out in print. This exists in the world now. It's called Practical Tableau from O'Reilly Media. Wish I could have brought some of these with me, but it is so full of knowledge and it is so dense that these are quite difficult to get through customs. Um, it's, it is 600 pages long, 100 different chapters. It is on sale at uh, Amazon in the UK if you want to check it out. I love sharing my credentials because it leads into my two favorite slides that I present anytime I do a training or any type of presentation. I've presented, presented this over and over again, but I really do love this story. And that is if I had to represent my own learning curve as a data visualization, it would look something like this. And I've been using Tableau now for about eight years, a little over eight years now actually. But I would say that that long flat line in the beginning represents about two years of really struggling with the software, frankly. I was self-taught, had no data background whatsoever. So it took me a little while to put two and two together and start to grow in Tableau. But I actually love that now, looking back, because in my objective for these presentations and getting together at conferences like this is that my sincere hope for you is that your learning curve looks a, more, a lot more like this. And I think this is very possible. We saw an IronViz contestant today. I think they said they've been using it since last July. I mean, that is just incredible. So I'm hoping very much to speed up your own learning curve. There's no reason you can't achieve everything else that I just uh, shared with you in those credentials. I do have one more credential to share with you because I can tell that some of you are not impressed yet. So I got one more thing, especially Rob over here. He's got very high standards in Master Rob Radburn. Um, but that credential I want to share, and this is a true story. Now, this is some real Ripley's Believe It or Not type of credentials here. I've never lost a game of checkers in my entire life. True story. The reason for that, I believe, is I learned the game of chess first. Uh, when I was seven years old, I had a babysitter that had this really interesting chess set with these just gigantic chess pieces. And I think I was just enamored with it. I was seven years old. I asked them if they could teach me how to play with those gigantic, interesting chess pieces. And they taught me chess. And I don't remember how good I was at chess, but I do remember how good I was at checkers because a couple years later in third grade, it became kind of a fad in our after-school daycare program to play the game of checkers. And the rules were you wait your turn once you get up and winner stays. If you win the game, you get to stay and keep playing checkers. So every day this went on for quite a while, wait my turn, get up and play checkers. I literally never lost a game of checkers. This went on for a couple of years until Christmas circa 1995 or so, uh, my father had, had caught wind of this alleged achievement of mine and challenged me to a game of checkers. You know, as any good father would, he was trying to strip away that last shred of confidence that I had and beat me at uh, the one thing I could beat him at. So I, I took him on and I actually beat him. I went ahead and beat him one more time to validate the small sample size, but that was good enough for me felt like I had beat my father and I'd moved on. This moment was so important to me and impactful in my life that I wanted to cement it with an illustration of that moment in history. Uh, so I, I have this here. And this is really where I'm going to start to share some of my own secret sauce. But the secret to never losing a game of checkers is to never play a game of checkers again after you've won. 
And that's what I did. That's actually true. I haven't played since that day in around 1995, because I'm not crazy enough to put that record online. <laughs> but it actually did teach me some very interesting life lessons. It taught me that fundamentals really do lead to success. And it's been really interesting. This has played out in some interesting ways in my Tableau career. It's actually kind of, kind of a similar path to what I went through when I learned chess first and then checkers. When I started eight years ago, you know, I looked out. There wasn't many books on the subject, so I reached out and looked into the community. And think people, Zen masters, were already doing some pretty crazy things. And um, I feel like it's kind of tempting to kind of skip the basics. And you know, they're making new chart types and fancy tips, and you're trying to invent new things and kind of push the envelope a little bit. But you kind of lose sight of the, the basics. And I did end up having some, some success. And I learned a lot about Tableau. But looking back, I've, I really do believe that all of the big achievements that I've accomplished with Tableau, so Tableau Public Viz of the Year, the Iron Viz Championship win, my viz included just uh, bar charts and line graphs, um, those, the big successes were all rooted in the fundamentals. Even some of the cooler tips and tricks that I do are really just creative applications of the fundamentals. And I, I love that Tableau put me on the same day as the uh, grand chess master, uh, because I'm going to tell you why you should use checkers instead of chess today. But I think that that's important not just, you know, it's one of those things that I practice what I preach, but I don't want you to take my word for it. I've got some really interesting data that I think backs up this idea and shows that it's important not just for me, but also your audience and your stakeholders, people that are going to be looking at the work that you build. And the data that I want to share with you to back this up is this bar chart that looks at my blog post popularity. Uh, so how this bar chart works, this is my top 10 blog posts from last year, full calendar year 2017. I've set this up in a similar way that Google Trends works where it's all relative to a 100 point scale. So that the bar on the far left there, that's my most popular blog post. It gets a score of 100. When you do that, all the other numbers are relative to that 100. So a score of 96 means it was four percentage points less popular than the most popular one. I mentioned that I blog religiously. I've been doing this for several years now. Never thought I could get this far. But I'm closing in on the 200 blog post milestone. But these are my top 10. I want to pose a question to the crowd. Anybody want to shout out what you think those two topics are related to? My two most popular by far. Excel? Uh, no, nope, good answer though. I'll give, I'll give you a hint. Tips and tricks. I'll give you a hint. They're related to chart types. I heard bar chart. Pie chart? Not pie chart. I think I, and a line. I've heard line too. Good. You guys got it faster than I was expecting. But yes. The, my most popular blog post of almost 200 posts last year was called Three Ways to Make Lovely Line Graphs. Now, people might have been Googling for something else. I'm not sure, based on the title. Nevertheless, that was my most popular content last year. My second most popular blog post is called Three Ways to Make Beautiful Bar Charts. So of 200 posts, roughly, the, by far the most popular, what people are looking for how to make line graphs, how to make bar charts. I found that amazing and really validated some of my thoughts on this. So I'm kind of betting on the data here. There's you know, this perception that Zen masters know everything and they're doing all these crazy things, which at least from a knowing everything perspective is absolutely not true. At least I can attest to that. So I'm kind of betting on the data. And I believe that this is what the market is most interested in. And I was really happy with this. Because I'm also a big believer in the 80-20 rule. If you're not familiar with that, it's really interesting how many things in business and just life in general fall into this share where roughly 80% of outcomes are due to 20% of effects. I see it all the time. A lot of stuff fits into that bucket. And I believe that bar chart and, and line graphs follow this similar pattern. Actually, on the corporate side of my work, I believe that these two chart types alone can answer 80% roughly of business questions. Of course, there's a lot of other long tail analyses and cool chart types that you can build in Tableau. It's extremely flexible. But at the end of the day, to do your, your basic analyses and answer business questions, I really strongly believe that those two, two, two chart types are typically the best for the job. If, especially when you add that third one, scatter plot, you can answer even more questions. But these are my two favorite chart types. 
This is what I'm going to start with today. I'm going to get very practical, uh, very tactical as well uh, within Tableau. But the first thing I'm going to show you is how to make beautiful bar charts. So these are some tips from my most popular content. I'm going to hop over to Tableau. And the reason that I want to share these is because I think the, the reason people try to push past these and do something different is they've been around a long time. I mean, these are actually the first two chart types. If you watched uh, Andy Cotgreaves' session, he shared a little bit about the history, but both of these chart types were invented by the same person, William Playfair, in the same year, actually, 1786. I uh, love these so much in this concept that name my company after them. That's where Playfair data comes from. But the, so they've been around quite a while, maybe getting a little stale. People don't think they're, they're very interesting. So I want to show you a few ways to make them a little bit more engaging. So this is the default bar chart. If I were just to double click sales and double click category in the sample data set that comes with Tableau, the reason that I picked Tableau as my tool of choice, I am very biased towards it, is first it's very flexible, but they also constantly reinvest into R&D. I know for a fact that they've studied this, they've looked at the best colors, the best fonts, the best layout, the best spacing. They've looked at all of that, but the default bar chart, in my opinion, still leaves a little bit left to be desired. The headers at the bottom are the obvious one. I can't even read uh, what the different categories are. So the first thing I would do is hover near the right side of the chart, and when this arrow cursor appears, I'm going to left click and drag that a little bit to the right. That gives the headers enough space now, but when I did that, the weight of the bars, in my opinion, is a little too heavy in relation to the rest of the, of the view. So I'm also going to decrease the size of these bars by clicking on the size marks card and dragging this. Usually that tick mark in the middle is usually pretty good. So I'll just leave it at that and call that good. Another thing that I don't love about this chart type, or this particular view we're looking at now, is there's quite a few tick marks. Every $100,000 you'll see a tick mark and a label there. But all the values for this chart type are between just 719,000 and 836,000. There's also only three marks on the view. So I might opt instead to do a direct label. Instead of having that axis with all that extra uh, text there, I'm going to hide the axis by right clicking, deselecting show header, and turning the labels on by clicking the label marks card and clicking that box. So that's the direct label it's called. And one last thing on this before I move on. Definitely an improvement over what we had, but I've never really liked how the bars just kind of float there. They actually are sitting on a line. It's called an axis ruler. There's a very faint gray line on both the y-axis and the x-axis. You can barely see it. You might not even be able to see it on that uh, resolution up there. But you can modify the format of those axis rulers. And I like to do that to give the bars a base to sit on. You can do that by right-clicking in any blank space in the view and clicking Format. Navigate to the tab for lines. And we're modifying the axis ruler for the columns, which is the x-axis in this case. So I'll click columns, and there it is, axis rulers. I usually give this a heavier weight and a darker color, maybe try to match the, the color of the mark. So now it's got that nice base to sit on. I could take this a little bit further, you know, I'd change the font to make it in brand, make the font a little bit larger. And I'd essentially end up with this. So there's the before on the left. That's a true representation of the default bar chart in Tableau. And within 60 seconds, just a little bit extra professional polish, we have made something that's, in my opinion, quite a bit more engaging and professional looking. I'm going to do the same thing on line graphs. This is the default line graph. If I were to use sales and break it down by a continuous month of order date and then color by segment, but before I do that, I want to introduce a topic called the data ink ratio. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this. Uh, this is a, a term coined by Edward Tufte. He's a modern data visualization pioneer. And in his 1983 book, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, he coined a couple terms, one of which was the data ink ratio, the other which was chart junk, which we'll get to in just a second. But I love this concept so much that I put together a 60 second video to help explain what this is because so many of my formatting and design tips are related to this concept. So it's a great thing to kind of have in the back of your head as you design in Tableau. So bear with me while this plays just a second. I'll pause it a couple times to explain some things. But the data ink ratio is of the total ink on the view. So anytime you see 
pixels on a view. We want as much as that as possible to be dedicated to the data. That's the data ink ratio, and we're trying to maximize that. We want, just, we want as much ink on the view to be get dedicated to the data as possible. <clears throat> to help illustrate, I'm going to show you this chart. This looks at the world's loudest stadiums. This is real data from the Guinness Book of World Records. Uh, not coincidentally, that's my hometown. That's a disclaimer, Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City. Uh, but we do have the loudest outdoor stadium in the world. So we're going to work on this chart, make it a little bit better. I want to point out one thing about this, which is the stadiums would be considered chart junk to Edward Tufte, kind of unnecessary graphics. So the first step is to erase things that are not related to the data. So things like graphics, get rid of that border, chart junk, different effects like gradients, different colors, di different styles. We're just cleaning this up. Uh, the grid, there's a lot of extra lines in there. It's an easy way to clean it up. Borders, you can see this is getting cleaner and cleaner. You can also have what's called redundant data ink. This is things like decimals and extra tick marks, things that aren't really adding to the view. Yes, they're related to data, but they're redundant. So that's the next thing we're going to do, things like extra labels. Like I said, reducing the decimal places, mark the tick marks, direct label when it makes sense. And then Tufti encourages you to revise and edit. That's the last step to get to your final desired result. So there's the before, after maximizing the data ink ratio. There's our after. So I'm going to do the same thing with line graphs. The y-axis in Tableau, in my opinion, a lot of times is a good example of redundant data ink. And I think that's happening here. There's, there's quite a few tick marks. So one thing I might do is make those larger increments. And you can do that by right-clicking on the axis and clicking Edit Axis. There's a tab for tick marks. And you can fix those. Maybe instead of every 5,000, I'll make those every 15,000, which will just clean that up a little bit. One disclaimer, word of caution on this, this is just what it sounds like. This truly is fixed now. So if you have a dynamic dashboard where the range is going to change, sometimes you need to be careful because if you filtered this to say to values less than 15,000, you wouldn't see any tick marks because the first one won't show up until 15,000. So be careful with this, but it is an easy way to erase redundant data ink. This next tip is also slightly controversial, but I actually prefer to also do this on the x-axis with a line graph like this. In most cases, I don't really care. You know, I know the names of the months. I don't need to see every single month there. I especially don't need to add extra lines at every single data point. I prefer to just know the start of the range and the end of the range. If you want to do something similar, I just want to point out that you can also do this even with a dimension, like date. The one catch is that date has to be continuous. This is green, which tells me it's continuous. So I can modify this axis just like I did with the y-axis that has numbers on it. Click Edit Axis. I also typically like to erase the axis title when dates are involved. You can take it or leave it. Some people like to share what the date part is, but I, I usually think that adds a little too much ink. I'm going to go to Tick Marks and fix them. The difference here is I need to, to choose a tick origin. In this case, it'll be 1-1-2018, so the first day of the year. I'm going to change the date part to months and bump this up to 11. So my ticks start at January 1st. 11 months later, there's a tick mark for uh, December. So already cleaning this up quite a bit. One last tip on this one before I move on. This line graph's good. You know, most popular content. People are looking for this. It's my personal second favorite chart type after the bar chart. But it's a little bit of a spaghetti graph. People call that when it looks kind of just like noodles thrown on the view. This one's not too bad because there's only three dimension members. But many times you're wanting to highlight a specific dimension member on the view. One easy way to do that is to just click on the color legend. But oftentimes there, there's an easier way and a simple solution to creating a more permanent highlight. And that's to simply remap the colors of those dimension members. So let's say I'm the manager of the corporate segment, and I always want to look at my, my own view in the context of the rest of the business. Just double-clicking on the color legend will open up this dialog box where I can remap these colors. Maybe I'll give corporate that red, and then for the other two segments, I'll give them some lighter gray shades. So they're still going to be there. 
I can still analyze them if I want to, but they're much more faded in the background. You might be noticing some areas of overlap where there's a gray line laying on top of the red line. That's because these go in order. And if you want to always put the red line on top, this is drag and drop. So you can just click on corporate and drag it to the top. And that'll fix that uh, ordering for you. So again, I could take this a little bit further, put it in brand, use my fonts and things. But essentially, this was the before and then this was the after on line graphs. All right, shifting gears a little bit, and I'm going to discuss a topic called psychological schemas. This is probably the most innovative thing I've got, but it, you'll, it's a little different. But I think by the end of it, you'll realize that it really is practical. And I think you'll be able to take advantage of this concept of psychological schemas. So first, what that is, you've likely heard as data people of a database schema. But long before database schemas, in the science of psychology, there was, this, there was this concept of a psychological schema. These are patterns that are all around us. We actually recognize thousands of, and thousands of these subconsciously. It helps us process the world around us and kind of standardize society to help us navigate the world. A basic example of this is when a child learns what a horse is for the first time. They'll, they'll learn that it's an animal, it has four legs, it has a tail, it's hairy. They'll commit to their mind that that's what I think a horse is. The first time they're introduced to a cow, they might mistake that cow for a horse because it fits the pattern of what they think a horse is. After all, it's an animal, it's hairy, it's got four legs, it's got a tail. So you can also adjust your schemas over time as you learn new information. The example that I like to share as, as an adult, which is why we've got this animation here, is when you go to a restaurant, even if you've never been to that restaurant before, you have an expectation of how the, the night's going to go. You're going to walk into the restaurant, be greeted by the host, be seated at a table, the waiter's going to come by, take your drink order, leave for a little while while you look at the menu. I don't even need to finish it. Everybody knows it's the same pattern. It's helping it standardize the situation so we can flow through it very efficiently. If we were to walk into the restaurant and be greeted by our waiter and he hands us the bill and says, here you go, you'd be very confused. That would disrupt your expectation of what was supposed to happen, so much so, in fact, that you wouldn't even know how to handle the situation. I, I argue that this concept can help your data visualization in, a, in two major ways. One is it can help your end user process a visualization more efficiently. And in the context of data visualization, if there's ever a disruption to that expectation, what it does with data viz is it causes a starting point for an analysis. And I'll show you an example of that in a, a couple slides. But first, to introduce the concept and, and start with a basic one. For better or worse, I bet everybody in the room has an idea of what these two colors represent. Right? Green is good. Red is bad. No one ever told us that. At least no one ever told me that. But that's what those colors mean. That, that's a schema. You, no one has to tell you what that means. You have an expectation of what that means. So at a minimum, you should at least understand when you're visualizing data that your end users will have their own expectations. So you don't want to make assumptions. You want to be very clear and make sure you kind of navigate their, their expectations. If you make a visualization about fruit, don't make the, perp, the grapes orange and the, that's hard to say, and the orange is purple, right? Don't mix up those colors. So that's a schema color. There's another schema related to shapes. You know, you've, you've probably heard the phrase, a picture tells a thousand words. Art and shapes are schemas. People interpret those in different ways. Yes, you have a little bit of say over it. So here's a viz where instead of having a navigation with, with words, I use dashboard action and those icons. And if you click on an icon, the funnel chart on the right will update and the numbers will update. This was my most popular visualization for quite a while. And I credit some of its success to the fact that it could go global. The, this one, schemas also have the ability and the advantage, in some cases, to even break down language barriers. So in this case, I didn't have to spell out the names of the sports, but they could still get some value from looking at this data visualization. And here's what that action would look like if you had clicked uh, female and then basketball, the funnel updated, the colors updated, the numbers updated. One last example to hopefully help bring this to life for everybody. The third schema is called spatial context, or at least the third one that I'm sharing today. To attempt to illustrate this, I've taken 
this data, it doesn't matter too much what the data it represents, but this is the lowest ticket price per section during Super Bowl 50 in American football a couple years ago. It's actually a really good chart. It's a bar chart. That's my favorite chart type. It's sorted in descending order, which is even better. If I worked at the stadium or maybe was a big fan and had always been to the stadium and knew what the section names meant, this is actually a really good chart type. But I've never been to this stadium, so I took a shot at reimagining this same data and leveraging this concept of schemas to help me and my end users process the data more efficiently. So I took that same data and I mapped it onto the stadium where the game was played. Now, even though I've never been to this stadium, I have been to dozens of sporting events in my lifetime, so I have an expectation, a schema of what these ticket prices should look like. I know that as I get closer to midfield and into the lower rows, those tickets should cost more money. As I move up and into the nosebleed sections in the corners, that's going to be uh, less expensive, cheaper seats. And sure enough, that's what the data showed me. I was able to process this almost instantly. So that was the first big way this concept can help you. It can help you process the view more efficiently, faster. The second way it can help you is if there's a disruption to the expectation, it would cause a starting point for an analysis. So if I were to map this data and see a red corner, that would very much surprise me. It would not be what I expected, and it would give me a starting point for an analysis. Something different definitely has to be happening in that corner. Maybe it's all you can eat and drink seats. Maybe it's some type of buy one, get one free deal. Who knows? But something different would have happened. One more tip before, we, or one more thought before we move on from schemas. I want to point out that I'm not arguing to do one or the other. You know, I mentioned bar charts, my favorite. But I do think that these, this newer fancy stuff can actually help complement those traditional chart types a little bit, uh, a little bit better than they can work on their own. So the real life version of this has both a stadium and a line graph below it. And when you click on a section in the stadium, the line graph under, underneath updates to show you a 14 day trend for that section. The next tips I'm going to share are all related to the describe feature. I was kind of curious, how many of you have even heard of this feature, describe, in Tableau? So yeah, about what I expected. Not, not a whole bunch of people. Of those that know what this is, I'll first show you the way that most people use this over here on my bar chart. This is the first way that I learned it. But you can right click on any field in your data source. And the last option is to describe that field. And this gives you a little bit of information about the field, like which table it comes from, which type of data it is. But my favorite way to use this is to click on this load button. And it loads a preview of the first 20 dimension members within that field. Before I knew about this feature, I would drag these dimensions onto the view just to see what the dimension members were, see if I wanted to use them. But that was very inefficient. If I was working with a large data set, Tableau would start to crunch the numbers and I'd have to wait for it to query the data set before I could figure out what the dimension members were. So that's the first way. Just first want to introduce that feature to you. It's very handy and it'll help you uh, with efficiency in your analyses. But you can also describe an entire worksheet. Let me go over to my line graph for this one. If I go to worksheet in the top navigation, the fourth option from the bottom is to describe the entire sheet. This gives you a lot of information. So what type of fields are on the view? What's the mark type? Are there any filters being used? What are the ranges of the values? All kinds of things. This isn't even a very complex view that we've got. And there's already quite a bit of information there. But this is a great way to reverse engineer either your own work, if you kind of set it down for a while and come back to it a week or two later, or probably more importantly, somebody else's work. If a colleague hands you a view or if you download something from Tableau Public to try to learn from it, this is a really good way to reverse engineer a view to learn from it. And for the last tip related to describe, I'm going to jump back over here to the PowerPoint because I don't have a calculation in this. Uh, those line graph or bar charts yet, but you can also, so this is a calculated field dialog box. You, might, you may know that if you ever see the colors blue, purple, or orange in a calculated field dialog box, you can click on those, and in the flyout on the right there, you'll be given some more information, usually a, a definition or some syntax on how to use it. If you click on something that's orange, that's a calculated field, it will show you the underlying formula in that calculated field. So it's a really handy way if you forget what the logic was 
or if you want to use some of that logic in your newly created calculated field, you can click on it and see the formula over there on the right. But you'll also see a describe button. And what's even better when you click describe is that you can copy and paste that code out of the dialog box. So you actually cannot copy and paste from the flyout menu, but if you click describe, you can copy and paste the code. Before I knew about that feature, what I would do if I wanted to reuse any of my logic and my calculations is I'd have to first look at it and realize it was the field I was interested in. I'd then have to close this calculated field, find the old one, right click on it, click edit, open the calculated field, copy and paste the code, close the window, go back to my newly created one. So this tip will save you quite a few clicks. Again, another tip to help you do your analyses more efficiently. All right, for my last set of tips, I'm going to use a special data source. Has anybody heard of the sample superstore data source in the room? All right, maybe a few of you. Yeah, I know it's, it's just so pervasive. I, I feel like it has become kind of funny. It's maybe getting a little bit old to some of us. So I created this dashboard for a couple of reasons. One was I wanted to really push myself to create at least one really cool corporate example with the 9,994 rows in the sample superstore data set. I actually just learned this week when I was uh, getting ready for this that the UK version has six more rows. You guys are uh, really up in the ante there. You've got 10,000 records. But I want to do something cool with this. I also use this dashboard to teach a lot of different tips and tricks as well as strategy. Uh, so this dashboard is packed with dozens and dozens of little nuanced things. But I'm going to show you three tips from the I call this the super sample superstore dashboard. And the first thing that you see is I've got these maps along the top. And this is a parameter where if I choose a different region, basically it's, it's just kind of a way to design it and show you where you are and what you're looking at. But the first tip I want to show you, very basic one, but I often find that dashboard actions are overlooked. This is a really easy way to improve the user experience. So in addition to just showing us where we are, that those map legends double as a navigation. And if I click on any of the states, the, all the rest of the views will update to that state. Very easy to do. If you're not familiar with dashboard actions, by the way, you can reverse engineer any of this stuff. I'm a Tableau public ambassador. I learn pretty much everything I know from, of course, the community, but downloading Tableau public visits and reverse engineering them. Because of that, I allow anybody to download any of my visualizations. You can go find this, download it, reverse engineer it. So if you're not familiar with dashboard actions, you can click dashboard and click actions. These are the three actions. The one that I'm showing you now is related to the map filters. And I'm simply saying, if you click on any of the maps, I want you to filter the remaining views. That's all it's doing. Very simple way to improve the navigation. The second tip I'm going to show you is a, is a little fancier, but also still very practical. The one feature that I prefer in Excel over Tableau is that it's a little bit easier to know when a filter is taking place on the view in Excel than Tableau. But there's always a flexible trick and a way around it in Tableau. So I'm going to show you how to build this filter in use alert, is what I call this. So I'm going to start a new worksheet, and I'll call this my TCE filter in use. And I'm going to make a calculated field, TCE, filter in use. And the entire formula, if you want to create something similar, is if some number of records, make this a little bigger so you can see it, does not equal. And then this is a little more advanced. It's related to level of detail expressions. But it's probably the most basic level of detail expression you can write. It's fixed colon punctuation mark, sum number of records, close curly bracket. You also have to give this an aggregation or use ATTR before it. I can either type sum or ATTR there. So we're just saying right now, so far, if the number of records in the view does not match the total number of records in the data set, is what we've said so far. So that would mean that a filter, some of the records were being filtered. So then I want you to say filter or filters 
are in use. Otherwise, so there's only two possibilities. If the, the records don't match, there's a filter. If they do match, there's no filter. So otherwise, I'm just going to leave it blank. Type end at the bottom. That's the whole formula. I'm going to drag that to the text marks card. We don't see anything show up, which would mean it's, it's not being filtered, but we knew from this view that there is a filter in use. It's because there's one more step. Notice on this filter in use alert, there's nothing on the filter shelf yet. There's one last step. You have to go to any of the sheets that have the filter that you want to activate this filter in use and make sure that it's being applied to that filter in use alert. So the filter I'm looking for is called region filter. I just need to go in here and make sure I'm applying it to that new TCE filter and use sheet. Now we see some text showing up. I might make this text a little bit bigger because this is an alert after all. Maybe make it bold and orange, whatever color. And just to show you that this works, I'll get rid of the original one. And then the last step is just to drag it onto the view. So here's my new one, TCE filter in use. Maybe center it a little bit. Make it fit entire view. And you can format that a little bit, of course. But that's a filter in use alert. And now when I filter to US, which means nothing's being filtered, filter in use alert goes away. As soon as I filter to any of the individual regions, the filter and use alert comes back. The last tip I'm going to share is somewhat related to strategy. So I'm going to give you a little bit more background on this dashboard and uh, give you a quick introduction to strategy. I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in strategy as well. But I, again, do think you'll find this is fairly practical when we get done. This is another thing that follows the 80-20 rule. In my corporate experience, I've always been on the consulting side. I've worked with dozens and dozens of brands that you've heard of in the States. And I would say still that 80% of them are stuck in the tabular Excel mentality. 80% of them. World's biggest companies. And it, it just amazes me. But that follows the 80-20 rule, first of all. 80% of people are stuck in spreadsheets. Of the 20% that have moved on to data visualization, I believe that 80% of those are stuck in descriptive analytics. This is called descriptive because it's simply describing what happened in the business. It's definitely a gigantic improvement over a spreadsheet. We, just, we simply can't read millions of rows of data and make sense of it without visualization. It's a huge step above that, but it still leaves a lot left on the table, a lot of value. So just to point out an example, if I were looking at this view filtered to the East region, one of the things that stands out to me is this KPI for profit ratio is down pretty significantly. It's down almost four percentage points uh, is what that's telling me. Really interesting. Would have been really hard to find in a spreadsheet, but I have no idea why that happened or what to do about it. So our goal, at least in my opinion, the most value, and there's something to be said for predictive analytics and data science. I don't think we're quite ready. It's a topic for another day or some beer sometime. But I believe the most value is in prescriptive analytics. It's explaining why something happened and prescribing something to do about it. So I've got this second view set up called prescriptive. I use this parameter dropdown. Just, I'm just giving you a quick example, and then I'll show you the tip. I can choose a primary KPI, so I, I was interested in profit ratio. Once I ch change that to profit ratio, I can already start to see a story emerge. This is the state of Ohio. That's our main culprit. That's what's down the most period over period. I've also got this scatter plot where I can set up uh, the y-axis. So maybe for my primary metric, I'll put that on the y-axis. And then for the exploratory uh, metric, we've got discount. And the story is becoming even clearer now. State of Ohio, and it looks like tables. Uh, tables was our only unprofitable subcategory. And by looking at the x-axis, it looks like it was also the most discounted subcategory. So that's probably why it wasn't as profitable. We're discounting it too much. So I found out what happened. If I was an analyst in the business, I'd most likely have an idea of what to do about this to improve the situation. Probably need to reach out to the guy in Ohio, tell him, hey, can we just you know, take the discount down just a little bit or maybe discontinue it because we're, we're just bleeding money there. The tip that I'm going to show you, that was definitely an improvement over that raw spreadsheet, 
But the tip I'm going to show you is how to build this custom insight at the bottom. So this is not an out-of-the-box feature in Tableau, but we're going to allow the analysts to add their own analysis right in line with the Tableau workbook, which is why I've got this third tab called Annotations. And this is, it's very simple. Again, this is practical Tableau tips. These are just creative applications of the basics. This is a, a parameter with a data type of string and allowable values of all. That's all it is. It's basically an open word processor where I can type in my insight. So my insight was profit ratio is down significantly in the state of Ohio. Reach out to manager and discontinue discounts. There's also a, another parameter that allows you to choose whether the insight is either positive, neutral, or negative. In this case, this is negative. So I'm going to choose negative. And I've just got a sheet down here that's tied to if they choose positive, that circle will be colored blue. If it's neutral, it'll be colored gray. And if it's negative, it'll be colored red. And then whatever I type in that word processor, processor shows up there uh, in line in the dashboard. So you can preview it before you accept it. Now when I go back to prescriptive, my insight is right there in line with the dashboard. I know this one was a little bit more involved than the rest of them. So if you are interested in that, you can uh, just search for how to add custom insights to a Tableau dashboard. That's how to do it. But just to point out that progress that we made, 80% of companies are using spreadsheets. Of the 20% that have bought in, they're stuck on descriptive. We move to what I think provides the most value, which is prescriptive, to find out why the descriptive insight was what it was, but more importantly, explain what we should do about it to rectify the situation. And then just to make it crystal clear so there's no confusion in the business, we've allowed the end user or the analyst to type in their own insight and explain what happened and what to do about it. Extremely powerful stuff there. This also works on Tableau Public, Tableau Server, Tableau Online. You can add an insight and it'll stick when you go back to the other dashboard. So in summary, I'm a huge believer that fundamentals equal success. I shared quite a few tips today. And I just wanted to point out that none of those were very fancy, to be honest. They're just creative applications of the fundamentals. I believe if you really master the fundamentals, you can have as much success as possible in Tableau. Before I share just a couple of resources and close out, uh, I want to point out there's a survey for this. Uh, please do uh, take a moment to <clears throat> fill that out. Maybe do it after your first few beers and uh, leave a good review. But no, seriously, I present at quite a few user groups in the, in the US. And, I would love to hear feedback, uh, both positive and negative. I really would. I want to improve it and make this as valuable as possible for the community. Just a couple resources for you. I mentioned my website is ryansleeper.com. Right now, I've got a free ebook. It's, uh, it's not your typical corporate crappy PDF ebook. Uh, it's, it's 124 pages. It is a PDF, but it's uh, got a little substance to it and some cool design if you want to check it out. But, uh, you can go to ryansleeper.com, and on the home page, you'll see a way to get that. If you subscribe for my blog, it'll be sent in your welcome email. You don't have to, though. It is free to do, but you can also just check out. Like I said, I'm, I'm closing in on the 200 blog post milestone if you want to check it out. Also, if you prefer a real heavy book, uh, if you go to practicaltableau.com, it'll forward you straight to Amazon, and you can check out the book there. But that's all I have for you. I really do appreciate you sticking around. I think we've got a few minutes. I'm happy to take some questions. Sometimes that leads to some really good discussion. Would completely understand if you want to get some beer, I'll be shortly behind you. But I really thank you for coming, and hopefully see you soon. Uh, I saw this one first. How old you What's that? How old it was published, it was released on Amazon April 30th, 2018. So it's very new. That's a good question. That's always a challenge. So the question was, uh, how old is the book, and am I going to keep up with the quarterly updates? Uh, you know, that's one of the best things about Tableau. Every quarter, they release new features. Um, my, I believe my style of writing and the tricks and tips that I share are fairly timeless. 
you know, the, the images might look a little bit different as they update the software. Um, and they occasionally do become obsolete, which I love. You know, some of these creative applications are things that I had to create out of necessity because they're not a Tableau feature. But they do update every quarter, and sometimes they end up in the software, and that chapter is now obsolete. But it'll be good for a while. If I am still constantly writing, yeah, and I'm not going to uh, work on that book for a while. <laughs> but uh, I'll keep up with it. I'm sure we'll do a second edition, that kind of thing. I saw that one next. <laughs> 